All right. Are people entering? I have no idea. Can't see. Yes, they okay. are. <laughs> cool. How would I know if people were here? Would I be able to see? Oh, participants. There it is. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm amazing. I, I This is not the first time I've done this team, I swear. Um, welcome. Welcome. Welcome to uh, planning your successful growth career. It's going to be a great day. I love life. I am being joined by my partner in crime, my buddy, Elena. Uh, we're going to get to intros here in a minute. Thank you for showing up today. There are at least 75 of you about to be in this room and some friendly faces, even though we can't see any of your faces. So welcome. It's great to have you here. I'm going to move random things out of my screen so that they don't show up. Okay. Uh, first things first, housekeeping items. Um, this will be recorded. It is being recorded. It will be shared afterwards. Even if you did not attend and just signed up, you will get an email link. So, you know, there are like a thousand plus people who registered, but we all know that free to pay conversion, not always the best. And so uh, we're expecting maybe a couple hundred people today. Anyway, recording, coming in hot. Today, we're talking about planning your successful growth career. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, Elaine and I are going to talk to you about our careers, about some frameworks that we've developed, um, and about when and where to make some career moves, some things that we've done. Um, whether you are new to the function of growth and want to know where in the heck you can take this thing, or you've got a million years of experience and you're like, I know more than these two. Let's just see how much they know. Um, we're, we're here for you. So what are we talking about today? Today, you're going to meet us. You are going to uh, listen to us ask each other questions for 45 minutes. Some of those questions uh, will be really useful for you. Others will be useful to other people. Who knows? We'll find out. Um, and then we're going to open it up to you and some Q&A for about 10 minutes. We will do our absolute best to get to that Q&A. Um, and uh, we will, in fact, actually skip some of our own questions for each other to get there if we need to. Um, Gary likes your junior and senior cats. Uh, gif, Elena. So heck yeah. Also good to see Leah um, in or Leah. Uh, I can't pronounce it um, in the chat. Thank you for hyping our session. Okay. Uh, let's get going. It is showtime. Um, oh, all right. So uh, we're going to start with me asking Elena a question. So Elena, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us what you wanted to be when you grew up versus where did you end up in your growth career? Hi everyone, so nice to be here. My name is Elena Verna and um, I'll be talking with Adam today about how to get to a successful growth career and growth leadership. So I'll tell you where I am right now. Uh, I do advising and interim, so contractual level leadership positions in growth. I'm currently interim head of growth at Amplitude. Um, I also create courses for Reforge. Uh, my course is experimentation and monetization. And we're with Adam also working on the course we'll talk about at the end of the program. And we're also starting to work on PLG course as well. Uh, I also do a lot of advising. I advise to Clockwise, Similar Web, which just started with Veed, uh, MongoDB, across numerous others. Uh, because what is better for a growth leader than have a bunch of data points that you can make patterns and frameworks out of? So I view my advising as a multivariate A/B test experience where. I am prototyping different ideas in different companies to come up with what is actually a pattern versus what is a data point. I'm also a board member at Netlify, where I held an interim head of growth position as well. And my former positions include SurveyMonkey and Miro, uh, where at Miro, I was uh, their CMO. And at SurveyMonkey, I was their head of growth for any product marketing and analytics teams. 
So where did I want to be when I grew up? I graduated with a degree in statistics, and I thought I was going to be an actuary. That's that person that calculates your insurance rates. Although in order to progress an actuary position, you have to take tests to get to the next level. And I didn't really care for tests. At that time when I graduated, um, the job market was extremely tough. So my mom, uh, who worked for a grocery chain corporate office Safeway, uh, got me a position as a marketing analyst um, in the marketing department. I had no idea what it meant uh, to have a position in the corporate world. I actually was not very familiar with it. And um, at that time, I only stayed in the role for about a year, uh, a year and a half. And one thing I just realized is that I needed speed. That was really important for me. So velocity of the organization. Um, is something that deeply mattered for me. So my next role, I really went to SurveyMonkey where I stayed up for about seven and a half years. Um, I went there all the way from data analyst uh, to uh, SVP of growth. So that's really where I grew up in my career and progressed through all of the stages to from management to uh, director to VP. But at the beginning, I started in data and I thought I was gonna be a chief data officer. But the title didn't exist at the time. So once I got to a manager level, my manager said, well, you need to pick another profession because uh, there's really no place to go up from here, especially in our company. So I went in product marketing next. Uh, and that was a really weird turn. And uh, that's something that I was not really good at, although I really loved doing. Um, so I understood that it's not my superpower. And that's when I stumbled into growth and uh, where I grew up. But in my career, I actually wanted to be a CEO. Now, the aspects of the CEO position where you are your own boss, I gained through being an advisor and a contractor where I do not work for a company full-time anymore. I have my own business in a way where I have my own clients. Um, I really quickly realized that the leadership level operator positions, once I got to that leadership level, were so heavy with budgets, firing, firing. Like there was a very little stuff left that I actually love to do, which is working on the product, working with customer and solving problems. So uh, I adjusted my view very quickly to not wanting to be a CEO anymore because that was not the lifestyle that I wanted and that was not the type of actual work that I wanted. It was more of a title that I was chasing after and I pivoted to say, I'm going to actually specialize in growth. I'm not even going to go horizontally anymore and try to do be a total general manager. And I'm going to just do advising, um, which creates and gives me independence. And um, I never realized that what I was chasing after when I was growing up in my career was the freedom of choice. What I thought I was chasing after is impact and a title. But once I realized what I'm actually going after is ability to choose how I'm going to monetize my career, that was the biggest unlock for me. But Adam, how about you? Where oh. did you come up from? And what did you want to be when you grew up? Great question. Uh, well, when I was really young, I wanted to be a professional hockey player. Um, I still play ice hockey, so that's fun. Um, and I live in California, which is even weirder for most people. But I'm from the Midwest. Um, uh, so I grew up and I was always really good in math and science. So I actually went to college to be an engineer. Went to the University of Michigan, go blue, for those who are on the, the call, um, and uh, started off in the College of Engineering. Um, and at first I was like, oh, I'm going to be a um, mechanical engineer. And then I was going to be an electrical engineering and computer science major. And then I was like, why do I have to take all these physics classes? I don't really like physics. I just want to like make things. Um and so then I was like, okay, I'm going to go and do um, like business process engineering, which is sort of like the consultancy path. Um, and then I was like, wait, but if I'm going to do all these business classes, why don't I just not be an engineer and go into business instead? So that's what I ended up doing. I transferred out of engineering into the general college and then um, took a bunch of 
uh, economics courses, statistics courses, uh, like to write, um, all kinds of stuff. So I ended up going to, to undergrad business school. I do not have a graduate degree, by the way. Um, no judgment on those who do, but it's not for me. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, so then I thought, same thing, like, okay, business degree, I'm going to be a titan of industry. Eventually, I will be a CEO myself or like a C-level executive. And um, I actually thought my first foray in C-level executive would be the CMO because um, I had a background in marketing. Um, and so my first several roles were uh, marketing-oriented roles with increasing level of responsibility, um, channel ownership, then sort of like team ownership. And then around like 2008, seven, six, I don't know, um, somewhere in the mid 2000s, um, this whole idea of being able to experiment on the internet became a thing. And so I, first of all, I was always fixated on internet companies because I like to build things. And so I always like built web pages, and websites and things like that. And then I realized that like, oh, there is a world for somebody who has like an engineering-ish brain and cares about things like consumer psychology. And that world is experimentation, it's analytical, it is sort of the precursor to growth. And so then I moved into that world and I was running experiments on websites. I was managing teams that were doing that. I ran like web analytics um, and things like that. And uh, then I kind of pivoted. So I said to myself, um, what do I want to, how am I going to get a, get a step function change in career trajectory? Well, if I stay at this sort of public company, everyone ahead of me is like, has like a MBA from Harvard. And like, that's probably what I would have to do. And I don't really want to do that. So instead, I'm going to get my experience in a trial by fire. And I jumped to a very early stage startup called Zimride. Zimride became Lyft. We pivoted to Lyft about five minutes, five months after I joined. And I joined Zimride originally to be the head of marketing for their consumer business. And that could not be further from what I ended up doing. So we pivoted to Lyft. I ended up becoming the head of growth of, at Lyft. And I did all the things. And I was addicted to startups. So I, uh, obviously led driver and passenger demand and acquisition. I helped with the marketplace balance. I built the operations team. I built the customer support team. I built marketing. I hired growth people. Like I did all the things and I was hooked. Um, and so for the next 10-ish years, that's what I've been doing is building those types of teams again at bigger uh, and, and scaling companies. And I love that stage of company when it gets too, too big, um, it starts to feel bureaucratic to me. So I stop. Um, if it is too small, I feel like it's too early for what I do. So now, um, so I've been a head of growth, been a VP of product and growth. I pivoted into leading product functions when I was at Patreon, although most of my growth work was trending in that direction anyways. And then most recently, my last sort of uh, in-house professional endeavor was a chief product and growth officer in a business called Imperfect Foods. Now, um, I work for myself um, because I reached a point where I realized, similar to Elena, that most of the problems that I was dealing with at the C level were not the kinds of business problems that I really wanted to spend my time doing. I wanted to create, I wanted to, to see metrics move. And most of my work was like at the C level is kind of like being a puppet master, pulling the strings on various things, a lot of sideways influence, a lot of managing other people's problems and coaching them through that. And that was interesting to me for a while, and then it stopped being interesting. And so now I optimize my life for flexibility and uh, the ability to apply 
and do work that takes advantage of the types of skills that I want to be using. So I create programs uh, at Reforge. I'm an EIR, love to talk. So that's a thing. Um, and I advise companies on product and, and growth. Um, but yeah, I think I thought I was going to be a CMO when I started out uh, after hockey player. Um, and so, yeah, as Elena mentioned, we're co-creating this growth leadership program. It's going to be lit uh, as someone who is really close to the material can tell you it's a lot of fun making this with Elena. Um, and so, yeah, so that's what I do now. And I, my life is a lot different. I have two kids, so I spend a lot more time thinking about how do I balance between professional endeavors and personal endeavors? How do I get involved in their lives? And so the path that I'm on with program creation and sort of part-time work um, and advisory work is perfect for where I am in my life. Um, yeah, so that's me. Um, and I'm also taking up writing again which is really fun. Um, I almost majored in classics when I was in college, which is really, really weird and different from what I am doing now. Um, but it is a lot of writing involved. And so I love writing. So I'm doing that again with my newsletter, which is really fun. So that's uh, that's me. There you go, Elena. We ended up in similar places with very different paths. That we did, that we did. But let's talk about different stages that you actually have to go through whenever you're growing up in the growth leadership career, although these could apply to other departments as well, whether you're in marketing, data analytics, or product management, or even engineering. There's three types of personas that exist uh, that we uh, all should be very careful at identifying of where we are. And then even more importantly, how does the market see us? Because there is a stage of where you actually are in skills level, and then there is brain perception of you that you have to manage as well. So what are the three stages? They are builders. Builders are more general generalists. Generalists are good at creating really anything across the board. You throw them at paid marketing, they'll be able to stand up paid marketing program. You throw them at optimized onboarding, they'll be able to go and optimize onboarding. You throw them at pricing page, they'll go and be able to stand up and optimize pricing page. Thinking about it, just the generalists, they're tactical, they're very execution oriented. These are usually the roles of growth PMM, um, growth marketing manager, where they able to go across acquisition, retention, or monetization levers and build up the foundation of what it means to have a sustainable growth model there. The next person is optimizer. Optimizer is not going to be your generalist who is going to be able to solve any portion of the growth levers within the growth model, but they'll be able to go down into specific channel where their superpowers are at and squeeze last 10% out of it. So if this is a foundational loop for your business, you would always hire an optimizer to fully get the most outcome out of it. So think about it SEO specialist, think about it AdWords specialist, um, it might be pricing and packaging manager, it might be somebody specifically uh, oriented around onboarding work and they know deeply how to uh, solve the setup a high and habit forming questions. Now that there is a third one, which is innovator. This is more of a visionary persona. They're constantly trying to find new problems and new solutions. And these are more on the head and the VP level. Any head or VP level in product or marketing is going to have to have innovator qualities along the side of their skill set. Because you always have to find a second horizon for your product. You always have to uncover new audiences for marketing. And same with growth. You always need to find new loops that are going to work, whichever growth motion that you're actually applying across your company. So most of us start as optimizers. We have a very specific skill set that we're working as an individual contributor that we know through and through. For me, optimizing skill set, for example, is data analytics, because I grew up in the data analytics up until senior management uh, level. And 
do I know databases? Do I know analytics and ETL processes and how to do BI? That is my optimizing skill set. But then it's really hard within an optimizer to get all the way to leadership. Thinking about a marketer, can you be a SEO specialist and become a CMO? No, you're going to need to become more of a builder or a generalist. This is where out of optimizer, if you are an optimizer, you have to figure out how to get to be a builder. So be a little bit more generalistic about the things that you're actually working on. You're basically trying to prove to the company that whichever problem they can throw your way, you will solve it. You are not a jack of only one trade. You're a jack of all trades. And this is the hardest pivot to make in a lot of the companies, especially if it's a very large company that is uh, structured around having a lot of optimizers. This is where you have to manage up and ask for work as opposed to expecting this to become a natural progression. As a builder, you will get to that manager level, potentially even a director level, which is when you need to switch to being an innovator. This is not only about what company tells you needs to be done and you're able to execute it. Now you're able to set the new direction as well. Now, regardless of your skill set of where you, that you're already in the builder, where you're ready to be an innovator, so much of it, as I mentioned, depends on company's perception of you. You might feel you are a builder, but the company sees you as optimizer. That will be a career blocker for you. You might already be ready for innovation or even doing innovation, but the company does not see that. They still see you as a builder. This will prevent you from getting to a VP level or chief level um, positions. So be very careful about A, understanding where you are in your next step. And most importantly, managing that company's perception, which is really about advocating for yourself. It's about showcasing the work that you're doing, managing up with your manager. So much of it is making sure that your manager understands your aspirations and what you're capable and wanting to try out and do. And then sending that market, that different perception of who you are, you will need to do three rebrands throughout your career, which is I'm no longer optimizer, I'm a builder. Then I'm no longer builder, I'm an innovator. And then out of innovator, whichever actual specialty that you're going to want to go into as a leader. But be very clear, it's a two way road where you are and what the market sees of you. Work on that brand perception, because most of the time we're ahead of this journey compared to the market perception. And it's very important to calibrate the two. Somebody asked uh, in the in the chat an, an, an anonymous attendee, which which I answered, um, how do you better understand what persona you fit into? And I think, um, you know, I, one of the things that I said is a lot of it has to do with like where where you are in your career, what your passions are what your aspirations are, um, you have to kind of push, as you mentioned, Elena, doing those rebrands, like you have to push yourself into these different areas. Um, nobody, if you're an exceptional optimizer, I don't think anyone is going to come to you and be like, hey, would you like to do this other work now? No, they're going to be perfectly happy with you just continuing to grind in your area because that's what you're really good at. So you have to almost like stretch yourself and put yourself into some of these positions where you're like not nearly as comfortable as you are in your existing kind of persona. Um, and that can be tough for a lot of a lot of people. So I just want to acknowledge that. But absolutely. Also, ask your manager, ask other people how they perceive you. This will also help you understand where the market perception of you is and especially if you're getting positions from recruiting that you don't feel are the right fit for you, you have a problem with the branding across uh, market. But let's move on to the next question. Adam, yeah. what is growth leadership actually responsible for? And oh. more specifically, even how does the job differ across different companies and different levels of growth model maturity? Yeah. Great, great question. Wish I'd thought of it. Um, uh, so first of all, let's talk about growth model maturity um, and what that what that generally means. Um, so you, you're what we talk about. We talk about growth models a lot, 
um, in Reforge. And we I talk about it a lot with my clients and Elena talks about it with hers. Um, the stage of maturity that you're at is uh, dependent on sort of how um, strong your hypotheses are in your growth model, the, the loops that you have, where you are in the stage of performance of those different loops, um, and whether you are uh, you need to innovate or go really deep or or something like that. And so um, so your job can be very different depending on where you are in that life cycle. Um, if you are uh, coming into a company and um, there is an existing growth model, um, and well, first of all, I would say, um, be wary of entering a company as a growth leader when there is no understanding of the growth model, um, because that is a challenging place to be, um, because it is going to take a while to build that understanding and you may not have that kind of runway. So first of all, be wary of that. The second thing is, assuming you're coming into an organization where there is some sense of a growth model and how the business grows and they have some hypotheses around it, um, your job is going to be to prove out those hypotheses and to explain to the business. So you're going to operate more as that sort of like builder um, persona. And your job is going to be to push on that, those different assumptions and figure out whether or not the company is correct on those. If they are, then your job is going to be to build your bench strength, right? So you're going to find your optimizers. You're going to kind of like build um, uh, 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 your team to focus on particular loops and go and go really deep in those areas. If not, um, if you're finding that you're wrong, um, then the job becomes to evolve the growth model. And hopefully you can do that work. Um, but that is where you will have to play the role of uh, innovator for a period of time and set the expectation that we were wrong and it's going to take us a while to kind of get uh, our model back on track or our understanding of our model. So the job can be alternating doing work, evangelizing that work and educating the organization, um, exploiting, uh, exploring. It sort of depends on um, what you're learning as you are working through your hypotheses. And um, I would say, uh, yeah, so th those are those are the general things that I would say about this. Um, uh, Elena, anything to add? And then also I'd ask you, what should growth leadership not be? What do you not want to do as a growth leader or what do you actively avoid? So first of all, your life is too short to work for a company that does not understand what growth is. What does it mean for a company to understand what growth is? Growth is about creating predictable, sustainable, and competitively defensible distribution model for your product, which means answering the questions across how do I acquire, how do I retain, and how do I monetize my customers? across product-led, marketing-led, or sales-led motions. If the company only thinks of growth as the small optimizations across acquisition, retention, or monetization, that's not growth. That's just optimization work. And optimization work is important because we want, we want to squeeze the most out of existing loop or existing growth model. But as a growth leader in your growth career, you have to be accountable for actual whole model across acquisition, retention, and monetization in order to deliver sustainable and predictable impact to your company. Because every growth model at your business right now 
will run out of steam. It will hit diminishing returns for optimizations. So you constantly have to optimize what there is and then lay down foundation for long-term growth, which is laying down foundation for new loops, new channels, new markets, new adjacent users that you can optimize in the future. If the company does not get that, run. Because you're going to have a responsibility on your shoulders of delivering that revenue user growth. But if you are boxed into only optimizing and most often on acquisition only, by the way, which is a terrible thing to be in and not be responsible for retention and monetization also, then you're going to fail because growth is going to slow down and you're going to be responsible and you're going to be on the chopping block because they're going to say, well, you're not able to deliver. So A, think about the company that actually understands that growth is not just an optimization problem. It is an innovation problem as well. Just like product has to go through innovation, just like marketing has to go through innovation. And that is a growth leader. You have an opportunity to have ownership over all three levers of acquisition, monetization, and retention. That's not to say you have to have it at the beginning, but there is a path to expanding your ownership across all. So if you see a job in my perspective that says growth hacking, I run. If I see a job that says only responsible for acquisition or even worse, only paid acquisition, I run. If I see a job that is only says that um, we're going to only focus on onboarding or there's no revenue attribution to anything that we're doing because we're only focusing on some um, potentially vanity KPI of monthly active users. I run because I want company to actually understand that growth is an extremely strategic position. In fact, head of strategy, so chief strategy officers used to be very top level um, create a deck for the strategy of market expansion, product expansion, monetization expansion. Well, growth leaders are those chief strategy officers with a heavy operating background. They not only create the decks, they also go and execute. So it's a transformation of the strategy leadership role. And if the company does not see that, well, you either go into it with an open eyes or you run away. <laughs> I love that. Um, and I think the couple of the, I was going to say, add to that, Elena, the couple of sort of career mistakes that I've made have been exactly that, not sort of vetting and uh, their understanding of growth and what the focus would be, um, or uh, coming into a company where what they really needed was innovation, which is going to take a while and sort of new loops. And yet the company was overly fixated on optimization and sort of short-term tactics that we're not going to get them to the next phase. And so I've learned how to assess that now up front before I even go into a company. But at the time I had no idea and it was a, it was a painful, painful lesson. So, um, yeah. Well, let it's me really give you point. an example of how this works. Um, I'll do a SurveyMonkey example. So at SurveyMonkey, we started growth team on just optimizing survey end page. Survey end page was part of user generated content loop for us at SurveyMonkey. You as a creator, you come in, you create a survey. That survey is a content and then you distribute it. So it's a user distribution to respondents. Percentage of those respondents will then convert to become survey creators. So it's a user generated content loop that kept firing for the company for a good 15 years. Well, the first step as a growth team was to optimize existing growth loop, which is we went and we optimized on that end page a lot. And it was simple. It was just a single page and we were able to get a lot of really great results out of it. Well, after we optimized that end page, we reduced our activation rates because we brought in a lot lower intent people through the top of the funnel uh, out of the ones that we've converted on that end page. So then we went on to working on onboarding and we started doing more uh, sophisticated questionnaires and uh, how to get started with uh, templates, question bank, um, and optimizing for that journey through life cycle perspective. Well, after we fixed that, we had a problem with free to paid conversion rate. 
So we went and we started working on our monetization model of how to account for all of these adjacent users and lower intent customers that are coming through and how to reduce the friction of monetization to maintain those industry high and free to pay conversion rates. And then we went back to acquisition and acquisition at that point was not just uh, that user generated content loop, we went into growth marketing. So we started overlaying marketing loops on top of the acquisition as well. So we were allowed to actually transition through all of the levers of the growth model, not necessarily maintaining pods, in each one at the beginning, we were literally like a tiger team going from one problem set to another every single quarter and then switching focuses if the business needed us and the, some other levers were going down. But at the end of the day, we owned it all. We were responsible for acquisition. We were responsible for activation. We were responsible for engagement and monetization. And we collaborated with core product and core marketing teams on shared resources to try to push growth culture as much as possible throughout the organization and have joint work to be done as opposed to all of the accountability falling on us. But we're championing that forward. And that evolution of the company allowing you to go into different areas and owning it is what you're trying to look for in the best growth leadership position where you'll actually be able to deliver on the promise to the company. Adam, do you have any examples from um, your past uh, that can uh, paint a story on this? Yeah, for sure. So uh, really good examples from my time at, at Patreon. Um, when I joined Patreon, they had um, had, a growth team at one point, their definition of a growth team was like two engineers uh, who like hacked around on some things in the checkout experience and generally didn't move the needle very much. And so it had been disbanded, you know, a year or so prior. And so I, I came in um, and uh, my first, um, uh, my, my, my first sort of charter was an area of ownership was to reframe how the business grows. Um, there were a lot of different opinions on that. Um, and so refocusing us on, we grow by acquiring creators who then acquire patrons who then become creators on the platform themselves and so on. And so I focused relentlessly on how we acquire creators, the right type of creators. Retention was not an issue for us. Um, uh, then what happened over time was we learned that there's a limit to just sort of acquiring the right type of creators. You also have to educate them and get them to launch effectively. So we moved from how do we bring people in to a deeper focus on their experience and setting up and launching their, their page successfully. And then... After we worked on that for a long period of time, we realized that one of the challenges we had was not necessarily bringing creators onto the platform any longer. That was fine. We had a good engine going there. The next horizon was how creators can better acquire patrons and retain them. And so we started to experiment with uh, the other sort of side of, uh, of the coin, which was the patron experience. And instead of saying, oh, we need a, a patron experience team, we tested our way into it. So we demonstrated that there were tools that we could build or give creators through experimentation that um, would do a better job of converting patrons. And we started in a very narrow area with the creator uh, page and how posts looked. And we said, oh, look, we're experimenting here. Look at these improvements that we're able to make in conversion. Okay, great. Now we can extend this out and put this in more places in the product. And eventually that led to the creation of a creator revenue team, which was a full on, uh, fully formed uh, product team, growth product team that was focused on maximizing creator earnings through a whole bunch of product changes and iteration. And so we started from a, we came all the way from our focus is bringing creators onto the platform to our focus is making those creators as successful as possible in their launch to our focus is long-term success. And now we're doing all of those things. And so um, 
each time we experimented in a new area, we proved out our worth, we then built a team around it. Um, and then I ended up owning all of those teams over a longer period of time um, because I had demonstrated success. I had been able to scale a team. We demonstrated more success and we continued. But each time we moved through this sort of phase of optimization, build, innovate into the next area and so on. And that's, that's sort of examples of some of my time um, at Patreon, at least in one particular uh, vertical. Um, Elena, there's a lot of questions on um, assessing, structuring a team, shifting companies' point of view. I was hoping maybe we could talk a little bit on building uh, a team. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe we could talk a little bit about team structure um, and sort of how you think about, uh, oh, there's also a question about, will there be frameworks? Um, yeah, we got some frame. We got frameworks for days, folks. Um, so Elena, maybe talk a little bit about sort of the structure and this sort of spectrum of innovation and uh, or sorry, speed versus culture and like moving a, a, along that spectrum. There's two main questions that people ask when it comes to growth. Should growth be culture thing? or should growth be a dedicated team? Well, both dedicated team or just growth tribe in the organization are very powerful concepts, but they solve for very different things. So if you have dedicated growth team, so you have head of growth, growth PMs, growth managers, uh, growth marketing managers reporting into that head of growth, which is uh, what I had at SurveyMonkey, uh, which what we had at Miro as well. We're building it at Amplitude as well. What that creates is need for speed because that gives you the velocity because you have the full autonomy because you have your own resourcing that is not competing with anything else. So if your company is struggling with velocity of output, dedicated team is absolutely the way to go. But velocity is not always the problem that the company can uh, experience because velocity and autonomy comes with a downside as well. If you have a fully autonomous growth team, what is the rest of the company doing? Is the rest of the company responsible for growth? I sure hope so. It's not pure responsibility of growth team to drive entire distribution system for the company. A good analogy here, I would say, is uh, analytics team. Just because you have analytics team in the company does not mean that every single little piece of analysis is going to be done by analytics team. No, analytics team does some powerful, very complex analysis. But then everybody else uses self-serve analytics or whichever reports have been built to be data-driven too. So the same thing is with growth. Growth is really great to stand up as a practice, to stand up understanding of the growth model, qualify it, quantify it. But then your ultimate goal of any growth team, 100% of the time, is to reach growth culture. What does it mean to have a growth culture is that everybody is able to connect their actions to an outcome of the output to the growth model, output to the business performance. And to stand up a growth culture, centralized, dedicated team is not going to do any good in that effort. In fact, creating more of a growth tribe becomes much more powerful vehicle in order to achieve growth culture. So you decentralize it. It's also very hard to maintain dedicated growth team. You might have PMs that want to be CPOs. You might have marketers that want to be CMOs. They don't necessarily want to be head of growth. It's almost impossible to have engineers reporting into growth. They want to be head of engineering. They should be sitting in engineering. Design, growth design. I've had growth design report into me. 
they want to be head of design. They don't want to be me when they grow up. So structurally, in order to jolt a company into motion, dedicated teams are fantastic. They can survive in some instances, but more common, it swings to the other side of becoming a growth tribe. So all of the roles that you have in the teams go into their respective departments, into product management, into marketing, into design, into engineering, into analytics, and then you create a growth tribe. You still have your pods, activation pods, monetization pods, acquisition pods, and you still have all of the people in them that you would have had in a dedicated team, but they sit with the rest of the organization because they are the change agents within those departments. And they enable their peers to do growth type work and collaborate with them better. So it removes that departmental silo of growth being on its own island. So if you're solving for growth culture, because everybody's doing things that not producing business output, you should think more about decentralized growth tribe. If you're solving for velocity, absolutely go into centralized uh, independent team, but also know that most of the companies constantly migrate between the two. So it's not a set decision to be in one position or the other, and most companies go back and forth. And as a head of growth, you may have enormous team of people reporting into you. At SurveyMonkey, I had over 30 people, or I can be a team of one because I lead a tribe without any dedicated reports. And both modes um, are fantastic uh, and work just fine in organizations. Awesome. The other thing that I would add is that um, one of the things that we, we, you and I have talked about, Elena, is that this can be a bit of a seesaw. I don't have my seesaw graphic here, but um, you can kind of move back and forth between these different modes, depending on where you are in your, in your, um, in your uh, sort of evolution of your, of your growth model. And so I've had many uh roles where we've centralized the team and then we've distributed it over time and then we've brought it back into the fold to centralize and um that evolution is quite normal right it's not all or nothing in one direction or the other forever and ever uh until the end of time so there's a flexibility here that i think people have to be aware of and uh change is a thing that you should expect in growth, uh, especially in a fast paced organization. But let's talk about how to start a growth team too. So what is the right level of profiles that you should be hiring? I'll spend just a second on it. We've introduced the concept of builders, optimizers, and innovators into your growth teams. Now, the biggest mistake that you can make is to hire for head of growth too soon, especially as your first growth hire. Please don't do it. Please don't look for head of growth, directors of growth, VPs of growth too early because the growth model should first be originated by executive team in the company. How is it that we're growing right now? The first hypothesis has to come from the people that deeply know business and can understand in authentic way of what actually helps it acquire, retain, and monetize. After you've established that in your leadership team, you first should be hiring a builder, that growth PM, that growth marketer, because they will help you understand whether your hypothesis was correct. So they will go and build out all of the processes and infrastructure around it, and show you, is there any predictability or is there any improvement after they've built it out of what you hypothesized in the real life? If it works, you should be going and hiring optimizers because your hypothesis was correct on the growth model. You've built it out, now go optimize it. If it doesn't, that means your leadership team was incorrect about their original growth hypotheses and you should go hire for growth leader to help you come up with actual growth model or innovate on it if you have no idea what actually is working for you currently right now. But if you're going into going directly into innovator and you're hiring for head of growth, you're doing one of the major mistakes of outsourcing your whole distribution model 
to somebody who will most likely, if they're just coming in, is just gonna be doing copy paste from their past. It takes a while for anybody to understand how product functions and what growth model works best for them. So be very careful to not hire head of growth too soon. You don't need that innovation until you optimize your existing growth model. So this chart represents the hiring sequencing that you should be doing across any growth levers or growth models within your company. Notice that people that are in the leadership positions in growth are always last to come in. Not the first, last. So you cannot outsource growth model, uh, growth model uh, building and growth model identification to somebody else. You have to take on accountability of that yourself. The only good example that I can also just bring, would you ever outsource your product development to head of product? So let's just say you haven't even reached product market fit and you said, you know what? I really don't know how to get there. Let me hire a CPO. They will do it for me. That would be insane. So stop outsourcing, understanding your growth model to the head of growth. They are not going to be positioned to succeed for at least six to eight months, and your business is likely not going to be able to wait that long to do it. But let's move into growth competency, because I do want to cover this topic. And Adam created an incredible blog post on it uh, that Brittany is going to help us drop um, in the chat. But how do you know what you need to be good at in order to be successful in growth? Yeah, there's a lot, there's been a lot of questions about like skill building and things like that. And so I would encourage you to, to read the, the blog post. I also wrote um, a three part series on, on this, on like hiring for growth and the skills to look for and things like that. And so if you put yourself in the shoes of somebody who's hiring for this position, it helps you think about what you, what you need. So I would say there's uh, an evolution that you go through in your career. And there's four quadrants here, but earlier in your career, you are probably more on the right side of this uh, of this uh, pie. You're focusing on growth execution, you're focusing on understanding your customer so that it can better inform your growth execution. And within growth execution, that means you have to know how different channels work, you have to understand loops, um, and you have to be able to experiment and implement those things or show how they can be implemented once you learn from the experiment. The experiment is not the thing that is going to change the trajectory of your business. It's turning the learning from that experiment into product functionality that can be exploited across your product that is the thing. And so uh, you have to be able to, to, to address that and make that um, uh, happen inside the organization. In the lower right quadrant, there is no growth uh, role where you don't have to understand instrumentation and data, like full stop. If you do not have a foundation in that, go build one right now. That doesn't mean that you necessarily have to write SQL queries and things like that, but you have to be able to self-serve data inside your organization. Um, if the only way to get that is through writing queries, then maybe that's what you do need to learn. Otherwise, uh, make sure that you become the expert and primary consumer of whatever data analytics tool your business has. So for example, at Patreon, even though I was the VP of growth and product, I was probably top one or two users of Amplitude, like based on time spent, charts created, uh, uh, analysis done, things like that. I lived in that product. Um, uh, quick plug for Amplitude, it's great. Um, and, and I was also the VP, right? So it clearly, like, that was a critical thing. Um, the other couple of things I will say around customer knowledge is user psychology is critically important. And what I mean by this is understanding why people make decisions, why they do the things that they do, what leads to them forming habit. Um, most of my job uh, at, in the earlier stages of growth and around experimentation has been trying to 
a push on the psychology of our customers, get them past a point, get them to a habit, get them um, to take that next step, to upgrade, to convert into, into something. And so why, understanding the why people are motivated to do that is incredibly uh, important. Elena, were you gonna add something to this? I saw that nope, you were muted. I was gonna move on to Q&A because we have- Oh, damn. Question. Okay, I will just end with this then and say, most of the work that I do now and as a C-level leader was on the left-hand side of this pie chart. Communication, leadership, managing sideways, upwards and downwards, modeling loops and thinking about how we're gonna allocate uh, our capital and do our road mapping. That becomes much more of your longer term job, the higher you go in an organization and less of the sort of tactical stuff on the right-hand side. And yes, now with that, we should move into Q&A. Um, there are way more questions that we can answer, Elena. I'm just seeing this. But there's a most upvoted question about managing up. Because mm -hmm. with growth, where growth leadership is so undefined for so many companies, it becomes extremely important in your ability to navigate organization, not only into progressing your career, but progressing the growth ownership within the company in order to set up uh, yourself for the maximum success. I'll give you uh, one quick story on my managing up uh, journey, which has taught me the biggest lesson. When I was at SurveyMonkey for seven and a half years, I've actually quit twice, tried to quit twice, I should say. <laughs> and both times I tried, I gave notices to the to my manager, thinking that the next step is just not gonna happen for me here at SurveyMonkey. So I'd rather just go jump somewhere else and shortcut to the presumed uh, value that I'm actually trying to chase for my career. The thing that I've learned and that both times they pulled me back and said, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Can we just have a conversation about it is the following. If you're really good at your job, if you're really good at what you're doing, your manager is not gonna try to push you to do something else. But when you're really good at your job yourself, you think that if I'm already crushing it, why aren't they giving me new responsibilities? There is an understanding that is missing between you and the manager always about where you want to be and your timelines alongside with it versus where they think they need to do in order to keep their department running smoothly. And two things that I think everybody should be doing, especially as we're coming up towards annual cycle right now is one have a conversation with your manager this week next week about where do you think your next step is and what do you think you need to work on to get there and how fast you think you'll be able to get there do not leave it up for interpretation it needs to be spelled out very clearly but number two never ask your manager of how to get to the next step that's the worst thing that you can do because they don't know you as well as you know yourself. So number one question that you should be asking is what does success look like on next step? Map yourself to that description. Understand where there's gaps and opportunities for you to work on. Verbalize it back to your manager. Agree on it. Agree on the timeline and check with them every three to four months to see how you're progressing against it. Do not leave this conversation only to happen on the review cycle because once the review cycle happens, all of the decisions and the promotions have already been made. There's nothing to change at that point. You have to have that conversation before review cycle when there's still ability to get into the promotion pool or uh, calibrate with your manager. And second of all, it should be an ongoing thing that you understand what you need to get to the next level. It's not up to your manager to decide. If you leave it up to your manager, what ends up gonna happen is you're gonna hit all of those check boxes and they're gonna say, oh, well, I didn't realize and you also need to do this. It's not their responsibility to figure out how for you to get to the next level. It is yours. It is your responsibility to understand how the management values the next level. And leaving, by the way, your position, unless you have a bad culture, obviously, and the wrong sponsorship management, is the biggest risk that you're taking. Not the company. Whoever company is hiring, for you, you're a blip in their timeline. 
that they'll never have to explain and they'll never have to be accountable for, whether you succeed or fail. For you, your next company, your company that you're right now in defines you, defines your brand. So you jumping businesses is a very risky move. So put a lot of pressure onto your own company to see what opportunities can be um, available there. But do be careful about being in control of it as opposed to letting the tide, so to speak, take you um, to wherever you want to be. You have more control than you think in your career progression but you need to be conscious and explicit about your asks. The other thing that I would add to this too, which I mean, I think is implied in what Elena was saying, but I wanna be really specific about this. Write this stuff down, put it on paper or digital paper so that you have a clear uh, thing that you can come back to your manager with regularly to revisit. Don't leave it to a conversation and, oh, remember that conversation we had? Like, write it down, share it with them. It bring, gives you something to follow up with regularly, and it gives you something to drive that conversation, and you have to control that conversation, right? And if you have something that's documented, you can also share it with other people in the organization. You can make it known where you want to go and where you're looking to develop um, so that it's not uh, necessarily... Um, only one person who's aware of your ambition. Amazing. So as a last minute, we want to do a plug for a program that we're building on growth leadership with Reforge. It's going to be for any growth leader looking to scale their career or anybody who's moving into a growth leadership. We will cover a variety of topics from which metrics to which um, actual teams and expertise you should own. How do you manage and plan your career growth? How do you define your positioning? How do you go into the market? Because growth is just such an ambiguous thing. How do you organize a team? How do you expand a growth team? How do you build your portfolio of work? It's based on our experiences. We also have incredible advisors to the program, um, anywhere from Airtable to SNCC. So please um, check it out. It's coming out next year. Stay tuned for that. Otherwise, thank you so much, all of you, for joining. You will receive the recording of this um, in your email uh, very soon after it gets processed. And um, really appreciate you coming together. And let's grow and create more growth leaders in the space. Yeah, awesome. I know we couldn't get to all of your questions. The Growth Leadership Program will basically address all of these questions, including fun things like how to fire your company, put them on a PIP, uh, and um, how to evaluate uh, companies ahead of time so that you don't get into a situation that's untenable for you based on things that Elena and I have learned from doing this wrong um, and doing it right. So really excited about this program. It's going to be live in the spring. And um, yeah, stay tuned. Uh, and thank you all for your excellent questions today. Thank you all. Have a good one. Farewell. well.